Hello, my friends. Thank you so much for joining me for this podcast. I'm very grateful that you are here. My name is Rick Thomas, and you're listening to the Life Over Coffee podcast, which we're also putting in video. In this particular hot podcast, I have an article for you I want to share with you, and so you can watch this article through video. You can listen to it by podcast or if you want, and I would encourage you to do that, is that you can read a full length, a transcript of what I'm going to present to you in an article format. All three of those resources are on our website and the title of them are The Carefulness and Competence Needed When Helping the Abused. I am going to walk through something that is super delicate. It is something that needs to be said. In our culture today, we as Christians should be exceptional in helping those who are abused, but unfortunately we are not. And so I have developed this article here I've written out for you. I would love for you to read it if you can. Of course, again, you can watch the video and listen to the podcast. If you are watching the video on YouTube or our Rumble channels, if you would subscribe to those channels, I really would appreciate it. If you're listening by podcast, of course, follow us on your favorite podcast platform and uh, be sure also to write us a review. Now, this article that I'm going to share with you is not an exhaustive treatment on abuse. It can't be. There is no way that you can do that. It would take many, many books to actually do an exhaustive treatment on abuse. And so you can think of it as a, a long runway. I'm just going to present one idea to you, and that is all. I do have other articles about abuse on our website, and so we, we have a lot of resources and webinars, for that matter, on abuse and victimology, and so you're welcome to take advantage of those. Many of those are linked right here inside of this article, but please understand this is not an exhaustive treatment. All right, so let me get into it. The carefulness and competence needed when helping the abused. Sexual abuse is one of the most devastating and complicating sin crimes that someone forces on another human being. And though I do not fully understand the horror of this type of abuse, because quite frankly, it has never happened to me, I have sat with many victims of sexual violence, and I have felt, I have seen, at least in part, the effect that it has on them. Even the abused have a hard time articulating what has happened to them, Thus, it is essential for us, the soul care providers, that when we are helping the abused, that we listen to them extremely well. We listen to what they are telling us. You need to be a highly careful and competent soul care provider when you are bringing care to these broken souls. And that's why I titled this article that I'm sharing with you, The Carefulness and the Competence Needed When Helping the Abused. Now, this podcast is about one thing, really, uh, the carefulness and competence, or you could say two things, but even that is not exhaustive. You need to tease that out. And so it might be best to think about this as laying the groundwork for serving the victims of abuse. It does not cover everything that you need to know when helping the abused, and that's why I appeal to you to take advantage of the linked articles that are throughout this article here that will give you a more in-depth study. We do have those resources on our website. I want to begin by sharing with you the opening line, the opening line in the Les Miserables Broadway song is called Empty Chairs and Empty Tables, and it probably sums up what sexual abuse feels like to the abused more than any other two lines of literature. And in this song, Empty Chairs and Empty Tables, here is one line. There is a grief that can't be spoken. There's a pain goes on and on. This crime of body and soul is so profound that the victims do not entirely understand it and cannot articulate the furthest depths of what happened to them. I want to illustrate my point here by sharing with you a fictional account, though this story does 
closely approximate many shattered souls. Mabel was nine years old when her cousin first started going into her room. He was 12. They weren't particularly close, but did hang out on occasion. He lived across the street. Those horrific days were the beginning of many years of sexual abuse. Though she would not call it by that label back then, she had no idea about the birds and the beads, and the words sex and abuse were not remotely in her world of thoughts. Her cousin said that he was playing, and, quote, all the kids are doing it, so what's the big deal? Mabel vacillated between confusion and disgust. It made no sense, and though she asked him to stop many times, he would not. And like most sexually abused people, she blamed herself, at least partly. Her anger had to go somewhere. When something happens to you, and, and you don't well, no matter if something happens to you, there has to be an emotional response. And of course, if you're confused about it, which sexual abuse victims typically are, they don't know where to place their disgust or their anger or their frustration or their hurt. And so it's not unusual for them to turn that in on themselves. At some level, she knew it was wrong, which is part of the reason she never told her parents she stuffed their secret, her and her cousin's secret, down into her dark place because her parents did not have much of a relationship with her. While her mother was mainly preoccupied with running the home, her dad was primarily angry and distant, the typical passive father. The children's concerns were not at the forefront of their minds. Mabel knew her dad would not believe her if she told him. Even if he did listen, she figured that he would blame her. She was already doing that, so there was no need for someone else to pile on her, her self-blame, something that she did not do. And though her cousin threatened her, if she said anything, she had no plans of talking to anyone and stuffing things inside. It seemed prudent at the time, though she did not know how it would rip her soul apart in the years to come. That was 23 years ago. Mabel is 32 years old today. She's married with two darling toddlers. They go to a sound church, but her relationship with her husband is rocky and she feels emotionally numb most of the time. Because of his immaturity, he is not capable of helping her. The abuse stopped years ago, but the impact of those long-ago assaults on her soul has never left. Even after becoming a Christian in college, the complicatedness of the abuse continually encumbered her mind. She never learned how to work through the internal pain. Now she has come to you for help, and one of the most important things you can do for her is to listen to her story, because there will be many levels of confusion and fear and hurt, collectively fighting for control of her mind. You could liken her soul to a busy intersection in gridlock on a human day. She will have to careful, you will have to carefully listen to what she is describing so you can help unlock what has bound her into this spiritual nightmare of the soul. Your listening must be on two levels. Mabel will tell you her story, what happened to her. You could call that the, the upper level, the actual facts about the abuse. She won't be able to articulate well what has happened inside her, that lower level, the dynamics of her own heart, the confusion of her soul, the strongholds that have captivated her mind. This will be the more comprehensive understanding of abuse that you need to have. Part of the reason that she can't tell you is that she will probably be afraid of you. She will be asking questions to herself. What will you do with this information? Can I trust you? Can you help me anyway? Will you hurt me? There will be a number of questions that will be competing in her mind. Another reason she will struggle talking to you is because she does not fully understand what this sin crime has done to her. 
She understands experiencing abuse because she has experienced it, but she is not clear as to how the abuse has changed her. You see, Mabel's abuser has shaped her into something the Lord wants her to understand and then help restore her to what she can be, could be, what God wants her to be. And so your care for her will help her know what happened, how what happened has shaped her, and how God desires to walk her through this life-altering, traumatic, shaping influence. Before the abuse, she was just a normal fallen person like you and me. She was born in a mess, as a mess, as fallen people, as, as Paul talks about in Romans 3. We are Adamic. That's how we all come into the world. We come into the world in a hole. But then imagine somebody like Mabel, where someone abuses her, and so it is compounding the problem. The abuse was piled on top of her pre-existing fallenness. Your task will be to walk her from where she is to the only perfect person that we know. His name is Jesus Christ. Working through the fallenness of Adam, our own complicatedness, and then the abuse from her cousin. There will be a definite disparity between who she is in Adam, that's the normalness, the fallenness of all of us, how her abuser has shaped her, and who she needs to be in Christ. You want to help her to cross these divides. I cannot overemphasize this point. Here it is. It will be tremendously important for you to move slowly through this process. There is no hurry to get to the finish line. I mean, the truth is that for Mabel, there really is no finish line. She will carry some parts of the abuse until she sees Jesus. I mean, you probably already intuit this because you carry some parts of the shaping influences in your life, and you will carry those all of your life, all of your life. But we can turn those things that were meant for evil. We can flip those negative narratives, and they can be used redemptively. And so I don't mean it as a total negative that she will be carrying the effects of abuse all of her life, though some of it most definitely will be negative. In the beginning, you want to listen more than you instruct. You want to take James's advice in 119 that we want to be quick to hear. We want to be slow to speak. Teaching or, or counseling always has an instructive feel to it. Now, that is good, but remember that when you're counseling an abused person, she may hear what you are saying and upload it through self-condemning ears. Remember, her anger had to go somewhere, and so she was disgusted with herself. She was angry with herself. She had to blame someone, so she blames herself. And even though those things are not true, they are true to her, and she could have an habituation of self-condemnation because this has been going on now for multiple decades. And there are several reasons for this. I mean, she knows that there is something broken inside of her to some degree, and so she will blame herself for her brokenness. And you hear other people talk about this when things are wrong, things that have happened to them. Sometimes they over-process it and they blame themselves for things that they really had no no input. They they really had no they they were not volitionally choosing to do this. It was something to that happened to them. And so the more you try to change her, the more it may affirm what she already believes about herself that she is wrong. And so move slowly. You must earn her trust more than anything else at this point in the process. Abused victims live in compounded condemnation for many years. I have described it as trying to put some, a soothing lotion on a person with the worst sunburn that you can imagine. They need what you have, but it is painful and they fear the process because it hurts. Be careful.
A person like Mabel interprets the abuse as being her fault. This pattern is typical thinking for victims of sexual, sex, sexual abuse. You can repeatedly say, it was not your fault, but it will be hard for her to disconnect her mind from the well-entrenched messages that say otherwise. This is the picture of a stronghold that Paul was talking about in 2 Corinthians chapter 10. It is a thought argument that rises up and takes the mind captive and that thought argument is against what Christ is teaching and as that message is becomes well entrenched it becomes a stronghold that does captivate the mind and you need to know this and so sympathy with a careful approach is essential though Mabel is reaching out to you because of your desire to help it will be easy for her to misinterpret your motives as additional affirmation that it that she is at fault you see you are an authority figure in her mind in her life and she has a captivating category for what influential people can do people who have power over her, over her is what i mean by an authority figure and though your intent will not be ill-motivated, though your desire will be pure to help her remember. You're interpreting this through her mind and how her mind has been shaped because of this horrific event or multiple events that have happened into her life. And so you have influence over her. You have power over her. And so interpreting it through her lens, she sees you as an authority figure, and that can be very intimidating. There is a fragile juxtaposition of needs. You want to help Mabel, and she needs to stop hurting. Sympathy, therefore, which is what you want, but without a call to change, will further turn her inward and make her more awkward but your call to change may twist her up even, even more. I want you to feel the conundrum here so that it can motivate any of us to slow down as we care for these people patiently. Christ was the perfect example of a person who could weep with those who wept and help those people move beyond the pain at the same time. Though Mabel has been abused and thrown into a bottomless pit of despair, she will have to do courageous things to get out of that hole. And so you must listen carefully and lovingly win her trust with a steady and sensitive eye on the future goal of helping her recover, helping her to change. You'll have to lead her to where she does not want to go. Well, you will have to lead her to where she does want to go, albeit tentatively. In Romans 12, 15, it does say rejoice with those who rejoice and weep with those who weep. In Hebrews 13, 3, I love this verse of scripture. It says, remember those who are in prison as though in prison with them and those who are mistreated since you also are in the body uh, so if she is hurting you are hurting as well psalm 40 is helpful also because as you weep with those who weep and as you remember them that have been mistreated as though you have been mistreated, you also want to remember that you want to move them forward. In Psalm 40, it says, He drew me up from the pit of destruction out of the miry bog and set my feet upon a rock, making my steps secure. He put a new song in my mouth, a song of praise to our God. Many will see and fear and put their trust in the Lord. And so you are weeping with them, but you are moving them forward out of this big hole that someone has tossed them into. We've all experienced the horrific tossing into a deep, dark hole. And Christ lovingly came to restore us, to make us whole. We are wonderfully aware of his love and soberly aware of his call to respond. Mabel will need to experience both of these things from you, which is in part what it means to listen to abuse. 
If you build in a patient way with her, she will begin to trust you. As you have probably already discerned, this is one of the weaknesses of counseling, and I'm speaking specifically of biblical counseling. Counseling is a short-term solution for people with long-term problems, and that's how a lot of people see counseling because, quite frankly, it is short-term. Usually there is a window of counseling of of three months or 12 sessions or whatever it may be. And this is where we want to be very careful, especially with someone who has been hurt to the degree that Mabel has. Someone like Mabel who has been in despair for 23 years and you're called to walk with her, it would be best if, if you had time to enter into her abuse listen to the nuance of her pain and began building trust with her. At first, she will want to know that you are there for her and that you care. Listening by asking a lot of questions will benefit her. It will benefit you, obviously. As you learn more about her, you can begin giving her more instructive care because she will be experiencing biblical hope through you because of your careful consideration of her unique story. Trust and hope are two of the most significant needs she will want from you. To trust you and to hope. The hope you are placing in God. The trust you are placing in God as well. But you are the person that's standing there making that connection between her and the Lord so ultimately she can trust in Him, exercise hope in Him. Both of those things, trust and hope, relate to how she does think about God, ultimately speaking. These may be two concepts that she already knows, at least theoretically, maybe academically, but has not practically experienced them from the Lord. And so you will be building these things into her life as you model the Father to her. You will, in a sense, be her representative of God, the Father, which is antithetical to her experience with her abuser. The abuser robbed her of hope and broke all trust. You have probably discerned how your initial and primary care comes through modeling, more through modeling Christ than preaching Christ at her. Though the Lord did not withhold his instruction or correction, there was a logical order in how he provides care to hurting, tentative, fearful sheep. Your words, your demeanor, your inflections, and hope-filled responses will be the means the Lord uses to release her from the captivation that has tormented her for years. Your time with her is a process. As she begins to understand you're not her enemy, you will be able to bring more transformative care to her life. Here is a simple way to think about the Father's patient care in four sequential steps. He loves us. He listens to us. He learns from us. He instructs us. You want to love. You want to listen. You want to learn. And then you can instruct. And I trust that I have built a strong case for going slow, being careful, and modeling the grace and mercy of our Father to Mabel. Christian counseling is not Christian if you're doing it without tears. Mabel represents two of Paul's three categories in 1 Thessalonians 5.14. He said, encourage the faint-hearted and to help the weak. Those are two of the three categories in that verse. And she's both of them, all wrapped up in one soul. Once hope and trust are built, you want to begin transitioning her heart, her mind, by helping her to think biblically about herself, about God, about other people. This process will be the core of what needs to happen in Mabel, and you want to take your time. She has a view of the world that her abuser damaged. She will need to filter her worldview through God's word while asking the Spirit of God to help her re-script her thinking. 
the word reprove in 2 Timothy 3.16, you teach and you reprove. The word means knock down, but I want to say that with the utmost carefulness because you need to be careful how you think about that word practically speaking and communicating that concept to her. You do want her to be confronted with the word of God and reprove does mean that, but Mabel will more than likely overfeel your instructive care no matter how cautious you are. Imagine how hard it is for you to hear the truth of God's word when you're called to change. You can multiply that by a thousand times over for Mabel. She may curl up inside as you bring any type of care to her, no matter how patient or tender you are. Because of her abuse, she may interpret your words as disapproving. I'm going to say it again. Be careful. You'll have to ask the Father to give you insight into the unique person who is before you. Depending on where she is with the Lord and how she responds to you will determine how quickly and deeply you can go. If she is not ready, she will not let you. She will let you know. If she's not ready, she will let you know through any number of means that she is not ready. And so you have to discern this. And I think I have experienced most of those clues from people who have been abused. Sometimes the abused person will intentionally push away from the counseling. She does not want to enter into the pain. It makes perfect sense. Other times she may test you. She is testing you. She's testing your perseverance is what she is testing. She may desire to reveal her deepest and darkest secrets to you, but will you persevere? I mean, why should I tell you what I am struggling with when I'm not sure you are going to go to distance with me? Sometimes they just choose not to come back because it's too painful. It is not the time. It could be that you're pushing too hard, that you're being more instructive than caring for their souls, and the instructiveness is not caring for their souls at this point. That's why you can't speed up the process. That's why biblical counseling can be a detriment if we look at biblical counseling as a short time frame. My point here is that each person and each situation is different. There is no cookie cutter processes. There should not be artificial timelines where you place expectations that speed up the process or manipulate her to respond according to your expectations. You need the illuminating power of God's Spirit, the insight of God's Word, and the support of others as you build your team to care for this broken soul. Counseling the abuse is not something for the inexperienced or untrained individual. The temptation can be to cliche the victims of abuse by parroting Bible verses because we don't know how to customize our care. It's okay to say that you can't do this. Maybe we'll appreciate your honesty, which is far better than making a bad situation worse. Through God's, though God's word is effective in restoring broken souls, every messenger of God's word is not competent and is not careful enough to minister in these situations. The title of this podcast, the video I have made here, the article I've just shared with you is the carefulness and competence needed when helping the abused. This is not an exhaustive treatment on this subject because you cannot do that in one article or a 30-minute podcast video. So if you want to learn more about helping the abused, there's a couple of options for you. You can read all of the linked articles. I have a one-hour webinar embedded here about victim victimology that you're welcome to watch as well. It's right inside this article. And, and again, all of those links, there's probably between 20 and 30 articles attached to this one. And so you can do a deep dive. For those of you who are interested in training, uh, I would appeal to you to think about our Mastermind program. It's an all-online self-paced study course where we teach people how to do the work of discipleship or biblical counseling. Uh, you can check out our website for more information on that. Thanks for listening.